that you will reveal yourself in a deeper depth and higher height, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, Father. We worship you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. of perception is the ability to ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through our senses. Okay, that means that we become aware of things how we perceive it with our eyes, ears, our smell, our taste, and our touch. All right, our spiritual perception. That is basically our spiritual eyesight. spiritual principle is seeking through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God through Jesus Christ, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry it out. Amen. Uh, when I think of this, it makes me think of him. Having that relationship, that closeness with God, just being brought into a one-on-one -on -one relationship to where God is in control. You know, we seek Him through prayer, through communication, through dialogue, and uh, God speaks to us in many different facets, but this one is geared towards prayer. Prayer is our main line of communication with the Father in heaven. And we know that comes through Jesus Christ, who has sent the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and dwells within us. So, when we pray, we must come sincerely from our hearts. Whatever struggle, mishaps, internal battles, good things, etc., 
we must and must come from our heart and fear. Uh, remember, God does not look at a man's stature, but at his heart. For me, this is uh, when we get into the Bible. I know a lot of people can choose different uh, heroes or titans of the Bible, whatever you like to call them. But for me, it's next to Jesus, but Jesus is always in the world. Jesus ain't first on the wrong, to be honest with you. But the next in line for me is King David. I know a lot of people say Moses, a lot of people say Abraham, and a lot of people, you know, can even say Paul, Peter, things that nature. But David is the one that, when I think of, of someone in the Bible who has the strongest impact on me personally, who I feel like, you know, was really just someone to really dig into it and understand how their life was and, and the way God moved in them and moved through them and just different things. And even to the point of where it says, remember, God doesn't look at a man's stature, but at his heart. I could be wrong in this, so if I am, y'all don't hang me for it. But I don't know anybody else in the Bible that God compared himself to. When he said, David is a man of my own heart. And that's not saying God said, David is on my level, I know him. But God did a comparison and said, God, is David seeks what I see. David really is after what it is that I have. What it is that I want, what it is that I will in his life. But if we go through and read the story about David, David shows his faults in a man. Too. That's one of the things that I, you know, that I feel like I can closely relate to David on. David shows his fault as a man. And, but David, you know, still, David was a man after God's own heart. And so, uh, you know, we're just to dig in to, uh, to show a, a, a thing of, of David that relates and ties into this to spiritual perception. We're going to go back to Zitlag. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. It starts out by saying, three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Melchites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed the Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When, his, when David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could not weep anymore. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from uh, Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger because his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him, but David found strength in the Lord. Then he said to Abitha the priest, Bring me the ephod. So Abitha brought it. Then David asked the Lord, Should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, Yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Let's go back to the definition of our spiritual principle, where it says, Praying only for knowledge of his will, which is God's will for us, and the power to carry it out. In verse, uh, in verse 8, David asked the Lord, Should I chase after these band brothers? That is, that is David's prayer. Hey God, what, what is your will? What is your will? And then he, he goes on to ask God, Will I catch them? Or will I overtake them in some friends? That some translations, actually King James says and King James version does say shall I overtake them and God answers yes go after them saying yes this is my will go after them and yes you will overtake them I will give you the strength the power to carry it out so, David was at a point in his life where he had lost everything. He had been out fighting battles on behalf of the Israelites. Uh, and while 
he was out, while him and his army was out, where from Ziklag, which was their hometown, the Malachites come in and raided and took everything, destroyed the town, burned some bricks. So when they returned back, David is at a point of being heartbroken. He just lost everything. Everybody and all his men had just lost everything. Now it shows in here where all his men started to turn against David. They started looking at things in the natural, from a natural standpoint. They started blaming David for something that was not his fault. How could he control whether the Amalekites come and destroy the city or not? David had no control over that. Yet, they were going to stone him to death. And David was brokenhearted, and everyone was weeping out, weeping out until they couldn't weep no more. But instead of David feeling sorry for himself, feeling beat down, or even trying to do anything out of his own self reliance, even knowing that God had showed him so much favor in every battle he was stood in, David standing and said, God, what would you have me do? This is where I'm at. I'm broken. That's the reason why we played that song at the beginning. It was intentional. I asked Josh to play it. And it was on purpose for it. It was talking about, here I am, God. Arms wide open. Pouring out my life. Gracefully broken. David was at a point in his life where he was broken, lost everything. He was being pursued by Saul at one time, and that's why he was in Ziklag. That's why they was there. Uh, but David was at that point where he could have just thrown his hands up and like, you know, or he could have even went out and said, "All right, troops, we're going to find these people. We're going to destroy them because they've done this." But instead, he's like, "Let me confer with God first." God, what is it you would have me do? What is the will? What is your will? How do I, how do I approach this situation from your standpoint? What would you have me do? A lot of times, I know especially for me, when I get in certain situations, uh, you know, it, 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 and it's just me being transparent, I tend to wait for things to get into a bad situation. And then that's when I want to turn it off. And then I'll be like, okay, God, I messed up. I tried to do it on my own. I messed everything up. I messed out of everything. You come fix it. Now, that's not every time, but, you know, that is a, uh, a fault of mine. And me and God are working on this. Too. And so going forth, uh, God completely understands your native language. Him being it. So you should always be in reverence, however you feel, what you're thinking, etc. You should be honest. I mean, in all honesty, you can't lie to God. He knows exactly where you've been, he knows what you've done, he knows everything that he is in your heart that you try to hide. You ain't hiding it from him. So the best way is just to be open and to be honest with God, saying, God, this is where I'm at. You know, here, and this is a uh, this is something that really caught me by surprise. I hear back a few weeks ago, or well, I'd say more than a few weeks ago, probably a month or two ago, I was told about a situation that happened to someone, someone that I knew. Uh, and so I began to intercede for this person. And as I interceded, I really dug in, I really felt their loss. But as I interceded, I also became very angry. And my anger was directed toward God. God, I'm angry that this has happened. And I, I was very honest about it, even with God. And even to the point of I started reaching out to people, saying, okay, you know, this is why I'm at. I really don't understand why I'm at this position. I don't understand why I'm angry at God for this happening to someone else. Now, later on, I understood that it come in to where I started feeling this, this person's emotions out of this people. Because this person was very much angry with God at the same time that I'm praying on their behalf uh, to where I'm standing in. And so, but that's why I was very honest with God. You know, and, and God knew, already knew that I was angry. He knew where I was at. He understood better what I was going through than what I understood because it wasn't until later on that I understood, you know, I was feeling emotions about the interceding. 
it's that point in time, and you know, people want to add like, well, I can't be that way with God. We can't be that way. That is so wrong. That is a lie from hell. That is a trick of the enemy. God knows where you at. If you're upset with what's going on, if you feel like something should be going this way and it shouldn't, you know, hey, you can be honest with God. That doesn't mean he's supposed to change and say, okay, well, we're going to do it your way so you can feel better about it. Mm-hmm. By no means, it still needs to be his way or no way. But you can be honest with him. You can be honest with him about it. And, it's, and, and I don't really know of any time that God has ever punished me for being honest with him. I can back the times he has for me trying to manipulate him and say, okay, well, God, you know, hey, I'm upset at you, but I'm going to lie about it to And so, you know what the Bible tells us? The, uh, the devil is the father of our lies. You start trying to lie to God, hey, you just doing the devil's work for us. So, uh, going forth again. You should always be in reverence however you feel. What you're thinking, etc. You should be honest. Other words, if you are upset, tell him. He already knows. He is just waiting for you to invite him into the situation. Now, this is really much, really a season that I'm very much in. It's the word. I try to bring God in situations. I try to bring, uh, I pray God in the situation. I don't try to actually. Break God in the situations. If God, God is situations above me. And when I don't do that, when we don't do that, we're acting out of self mind. You know, I remember back at times when I was addicted to uh, drugs and just standing in this or that, working in my own separate line, looking for something else to try to fill a void that only God could fill. Looking for answers out of something that would know me as opposed to healing that God would. You know, and, and, and throughout those times, now I look back and, and, and even to the point I recognize of how comfortable I was in those situations. I was comfortable getting high. I was comfortable being numb. I was comfortable living from day to day uh, and just absolute hell. Just for a lack of a better word, just absolute hell. I was living life in hell. And then coming in, and God is being so intentional. God is being so intentional in lining things up to where it changed my spiritual perception. It changed, uh, you know, how I saw things. It come in and started filling a void that only God could fill in me. Not that I could numb away, not that I could uh, toss to the side, but came in and started changing my mind because God sought that intimate time with me. Not just me seeking that intimate time with him. You know, the Bible tells us we love because he loved us first. God wanted intimacy with us before we wanted intimacy with him. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That's why Jesus came to walk upon this earth. That is Jesus' testimony. I loved you so much, I willingly laid down my life. I could have I could have called, I had control and Authority over every angel in heaven. I could have wiped every one off the planet. But I love even those that were rejecting me, those that were destroying me, those that were out to kill me, those that were uh, persecuting me. I love them so much that he still went upon that cross for me. And even on it, even at the point of him hanging upon that cross, he demonstrates that by saying, Father, please forgive them for they know, know not what they do. There was, the Jews was waiting on the Messiah, but when the Messiah came, they didn't accept him. They rejected him. They kicked him out. And even at that point in time, he's like, Father, you know, they don't realize that, it's, that I am who I am. Now, there was the ones, you know, the apostles, and, and even, you know, we go down to the 70, the multitudes in the crowd that came to know Jesus. But for the most part, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the higher up, rejected Jesus. Even to the point of having a killer set free so that Jesus would die. And so, he's just waiting for us to invite him.
come in our situation. You know, and that and that's what David did. That's what David did at Big Lake. He's like, Father, this is where I'm at. Bring me the ephod. That was their access to God at that point in time. We have Holy Spirit now. David had an ephod. He had to do a physical action of putting a priestly garment on him to be in direct contact with God. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. We have Holy Spirit now. We have Jesus that, you know, died to give us that access to rip the veil to where we are now the priests and kings by the word of God. To where we have access to the Holy of Holies. That we was consecrated through his sacrifice that he made for us. And so David said, bring me the ephod. And when they brought the ephod, God, what is it I do? What is it I do? How can you handle this situation? What is it I do in this situation that you won't know? And it's just so profound, man, because I, I mean, my wife is sitting here with me, and I couldn't imagine if someone came in here and, 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 and took her. It would be hard for my first initial reaction to be dropped down, God, you want me to chase after him? Or do I just sit here? No, I might be praying to God while I'm chasing after him, but my first reaction is okay. I need to save her. And then on top of that, my second reaction is going to be, I need to give her, you know, being transparent here, I'm not saying this is the way anybody should be, but I want to get revenge on the ones that done this to me. But what does the Bible say about revenge? God says vengeance is needed. In the world. So, uh, there is a difference in talking to God and talking to God. When you talk to God, you expect something in return. You expect to hear something back. When you talk at God, you just expect somebody, like, if I'm talking to my brother Josh here, if I'm talking to him, I expect to hear a conversation. If I'm talking to my brother Adrian, I'm talking to any of my sisters in here. My daughter, my little nephew sitting over here, John Haven. If I'm talking to them, I expect a conversation. I expect a dialogue. If I'm talking at someone, I just want you to hear what I got to say and don't really care what you got to say back. That's just, I mean, that's plain and simple. I just want you to hear what it is I have to say. Don't be your input at all. And that's the same way with God. We need to speak to Him to the point of expecting to hear back. And it may not be what we want to hear. But it is, I can assure you it is what is best for us. It may not be what we want to hear, but it can be what we need to hear. Because following God, you know, it's it's not always He sees the best outcome for us to where a lot of times we don't see what's right in front of us. And so Just as you share what's on your heart, mind, and will, God will then share uh, what's on His heart, will, and mind to improve your con conscious contact with Him. I mean, we must read, we must study, and we must meditate on His Word. God never said, say a prayer to get saved. But Jesus simply said, follow Him. Jesus is our example in life. He was the standard that we are to go after. When he chose his disciples, he didn't go up to them and strike up a conversation. Or at least not in the picture that I have in my mind of it. He simply walked up to them, said, follow me. They dropped everything they had, laid down their life. Very prophetic. If you dig, dig into it, to follow Jesus. I mean, I, I see him just walking up to Peter and, and uh, James and John on the boat saying, hey, follow me. Mm -hmm. And then we get out of the boat, you know, like, like Peter did after Jesus had uh, been on the cross. When he saw him, he realized it was Jesus on the, on the shore. He just, out the boat, he went. I see that being the same way. Jesus saying, follow me. And following him is not always, uh, you know, the easy thing. It's not always easy. Sounds easy, but it's not. Following his example. And, and that's okay because he meets us right where we are. And it's
this a day to day, second by second relationship with God and with Jesus that we go through, that we find ourselves approved. We find ourselves with salvation. We find ourselves uh, standing in righteousness for God of Him. It's not anything we can do, it's we cannot earn our way into it. Jesus paid that price for us. That price has already been paid. We just have to live by His example. <coughs> We have to accept Him and go forth and live by His example to follow His kingdom, to bring others into the realization that uh, you know Jesus is Lord, that there is a better way. Because at one point in time, like I said, going back to when I was in, in my walking captivity, uh, bound by drugs and, and bound by living in this way of the world, you know, uh, there was times I thought life was just great. I thought life was good. You know, I couldn't lie to myself. I couldn't lie to myself and convince myself that while I'm getting high, everything's okay. Everything's numb. I ain't bothering nobody. It's just me doing this to myself. Until Jesus stepped on the scene. Then I found out what true love is. I found out what peace is. I found out what grace is. I found out what mercy is. And it was very much shown to me. Even though I didn't deserve it. Even though None of us have done it. We have all sinned because of children God's will. But yet, He still wants us. He still wants us to give us that glory. He still calls us by name. And so, Matthew 16 and 24, Jesus told His disciples, If even would, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's an ESV. And in this, you know, it sounds very much contradictory. If I save my life, then I lose it. But if I lose my life for his name's sake, then I save it. Uh, how do you lose something saved? Sounds very contradictory. That's from my carnal mindset. From a biblical, from a godly standpoint, we have to lose our lives. Because once we accept Jesus, it's no longer our life that He is. And it's His life, we are just vessels of Him from that point on. For Him to facilitate through us. For Him to walk, for us to be walking epistles, walking testimonies, so that we can lead others to Christ. So we can there is a lot of people that I can reach through my testimony and my laid down life and my submission to God and to Jesus <coughs> that not everybody can be. I mean, that everybody can bring in. And so that laid down life where in that natural mindset, it, it, it seems so just contradictory. But I lost my life. I gave my life over to Christ. Christ said he, brought, he came to bring life and life in abundance. I just say, I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you life in abundance of it. That doesn't mean a long a longevity of life. That means I'm going to give you a life worth living, a peaceful life, a life where, you know, the things that once bound you down are you no longer bound by. A life of freedom, a life of, of I mean, it's just, it's really hard to explain. But for me, the greatest thing is the peace that I can wake up with every day. It's the peace in knowing no matter what my situation, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what it is that is coming against me, that God is still in control of that situation. He's just waiting for us to bring him into it. Because he will. He'll just stand on the side of him. Be like, hey, you think you can do it by yourself? I'll let you. It ain't going to take long to lose that peace, is it? It ain't going to take long at all. As you lose that peace for a little bit, at least from my perspective, as you lose that peace for a little bit, all right, God, you know, like I said earlier, I messed it up. Hey, God, I messed it up. Yeah. Can you come pick up the peace? Can you put it back together when I just destroy it? And so, uh, to, to deny self means to put aside our own selfish desires 
in order to follow Jesus and serve his purpose, whatever the cost. Sin is no longer our master, but we will have to choose daily to say no to temptation. Temptation comes in the form of our carnal desires and appetites. You must understand that God does not tempt. That is what we are told in James 1 and 13. John 10 and 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So God speaks in multi facets, promises, uh, but promises is we hear them, and intimacy takes place through that which we get direction. You know, and, and that comes in with that relationship I was talking about earlier. That intimate, one-on-one, day-by-day, even to the point of a maturing relationship. That intimate time with God. That intimate time with Jesus Christ. That intimate time, uh, just, you know, let Holy Spirit demonstrate to you. But there's nothing like His presence. Nothing like peace that comes in his presence. There's nothing like the love that you can feel in the presence of God. It's, I mean, it's really it's something that has to be experienced. And so, uh, this is eternal and abundant life. Uh, when I'm talking about Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. Uh, an abundant life is this a life of love. A life of joy, a life of peace, a life of patience, a life, a life of kindness, a life of goodness, a life of faithfulness, a life of gentleness, and a life of self-control. If anyone's ever looked at this. What is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? That is what we're here. We must offer and guarantee. That is the promise God makes us. That is our abundant life. Like I said, it doesn't come down to longevity. Oh, I'm not going to live to be 150 years old. And well, you know, if God sees fit for that, I'm not supposed to tell short to say I can't. But I am promised the life of love, life of, a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of, a life of patience, uh, so on and so forth. By being intentional about our spiritual perception, we truly know He will protect us no matter what. It also gives us the wisdom not to jump out of His hand. I think that comes down to wanting to be in His presence. You know, we do have that choice that we can turn and walk away. But I'm going to be honest with you, why would you? Why would you after you experience Him? Experience what life has to offer now that you've accepted it. And has my life been just all sunshine and rainbows? No. No. I still really live real life. I still go through day to day things on constantly. The di only difference is now I have someone that's greater than my day to day things. And my day to day comes beneath him. It just comes down to the point of turning to him. That doesn't mean everything's going to get better right then. But I can assure you it's going to start turning some wheels to where what his will is and what his plan is, yeah. it's just going to start coming into play. His intentionalness is going to start playing in your life. And so, he will protect us no matter what. It also gives us the wisdom not to jump out of his hand. Now, as we mature in him, we realize the delegated authority he has given us as sons and daughters. At this point, you truly know your position as a bond servant. One that can leave but chooses to submit. Then he will show us our function. Let us look at Paul in Romans 1 1. Romans 1 1 starts out Paul a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul himself says, okay, this is my position. First and foremost, I'm a bond servant. My position as a bond 
my servant to Christ, which is one who can live, lives. I mean, one who can leave but chooses to stay. A bond servant, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way for me to elaborate on this, would be like someone You know, someone that was bound to someone for some reason. And then they fulfilled that obligation. Yes, I really want to. <laughs> uh, you know, they really do talk a lot about that in those times. And as, as slavery. Back in those days, you know, biblically speaking, it's also slavery. But once these slaves met the obligations that they had to meet to become set free and they choose to stay, they become bonds. They willingly have, you know, they have no obligation to stay other than their own free will and free choice. You know how they free the slave man? They gave my own little clothes. I did not know that. They didn't have no clothes, they were just walking around naked. They gave their own little clothes. Hey, you know what, baby? Jesus Smith. His function was an apostle. He was called to be an apostle. He was anointed to be an apostle. But as a son, he chose to be a bondservant. As sons and daughters, we willingly choose to be bondservants in Christ. We willingly choose to be bondservants of the Father. That doesn't mean, you know, that is one thing that we all have in common. That is a common factor that uh, connects every one of us. Now, when it comes down to our function that we're called to, that can come something totally different. Uh, we're going to skip down to verse 4. Who has declared the Son of God with power by the res resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom have we, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake. Among whom you are also called, also, also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul's kind of elaborating here about being a monster. We're called for Jesus Christ. He chose us, and, you know, he chose us before we sent our brother in. He knew where it's going to be at. What time is going to be there? Where we start the journey? And he called us by name. Thank you, God, for grace. Thank you, God, for mercy. And you know it's just amazing. And this is where I've been, you know, here recently. Amazed at how God is just how honored. Throughout my past, I have a very, you know, from world term, bad past. I was a very bad person. I was the least of the least and the lowest of the lowest. There's very few things in this life I have done to harm, hurt, manipulate, whatever it may be, someone else. It does define me. It does define me. I'm defined by God. And the thing about it is, is I walked through every bit of that. God kept me through every bit of that to give me a testimony to bring to others so that I can relate to others and bring them to God gave me grace and showed me mercy when I didn't deserve it. But at that point in time, now I feel honored to where a lot of people want to feel shame and guilt in my past. I feel honored that God kept me through that. There is people that didn't have me kept through those things in life. I was addicted to drugs for years. Got sober for 13 years. Fell back into drugs. Something uh, that I said I would rather be dead than have to, than to do again. Still fell back into it. But yet, God kept me through that. He kept me through that part of my life. How many times can you turn, I mean, you can turn on the TV, news, whatever you want to, and you'll hear about somebody dying of drug addiction every day. Multiple people. I thank God for grace and mercy. I love one of them. And now I carry that same testimony to bring that what others will relate to to bring them up out of what I walk through. That is honoring to me. God was intentional in my life to keep me through everything I went through to do his kingdom work here on earth. I mean, how can you not feel honored by that? 
It's not about how bad I was. It's about how amazing and how good he is. I love the way he wants to be blessed. <laughs> Romans 1 and 11. For I long to see you so that I may part some spiritual gifts to you that you may be established. And that is uh, seeking through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God through Jesus Christ. Praying only for knowledge of His will and the power to carry it out. You know, I talked about how Jesus was uh, the example for us to follow. So if we look at this right here, we look at this definition of spiritual perception. How can we relate that to you? I'm glad y'all asked. <laughs> We're going to do just that. We're going to turn to uh, Mark chapter 14. Uh, let's see. We're going to read verses 33 through 36 and 39. And this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Give everybody that uh, uh, context of where we're at. And actually, we're going to start at chapter, uh, verse 32. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and struck. Yeah. Jesus, the God of all creation, the Father in flesh on earth, became deeply troubled and straight. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed. This is where we're going to come in context with the scripture from. Jesus prayed. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour of waiting with him might pass him by. Verse 36, Abba Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus is, is, is reaching out to his Father. He's reaching out to God. Saying, God, this is where I'm at. He's being honest. And this is why I'm at. I know what's coming. Can you take this cup from me? Can I not have to walk through this? All things are possible through you. Can you take this from me? Now, do I believe Jesus would still lay down his life? Absolutely. But there were things he didn't, he didn't want to go through. And it was for a demonstration to us. That's what it was for. That's what this is for, is a demonstration to us. When Jesus himself said, God, can you play, please take this from me? But not my will, but yours. And we're going to go down to uh, 39. And this is the second time. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. Father, if, if I have my choice in this, take this from me. But not my will, but yours. And then Jesus goes on again in the Garden of Gethsemane a third time and prays the same prayer. And the book of Luke, it actually talks about him praying to a point of where sweat is dripping off from my throat. I mean, Jesus was Jesus was in on, on praying. He was all in. Hey, this is why I'm at. Why I'm at, Father. We know Jesus is God manifesting the flesh on earth. But still at the same time, Jesus is a another dimension of, of what, who God is. And so Jesus was getting to the point of laying down his life for everyone. He started taking on the sin of the world at this point in time. He started taking on the burden. I mean, you have to understand. He took on every sin that was at his time and every sin that was to come. Now, let me put this in context to you. I've lived a life in D.C. before Christ that, like I said, I'm a horrible person. 
I would do whatever it took for Joe. I mean, I was the type of person that I did have compassion for people. And even to the point, you know, if I was there, we get up very little. If I was there, we got to But for the most part, most of my life was spent focused on myself. And it's just one life or sin. Mine was just one life. Start thinking of how many people have lived over the past 2,000 years. How many sins was committed. Jesus started taking on the weight of more than even the, the world would be able to handle. He bore those sins. Put that into context. If you can take this cup from me, let this cup pass me, but not my will, but yours, Father. Now put yourself in that situation. Would you be willing to take on the sins of the world? To carry that burden, I tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, I'll carry my own burden. <laughs> I don't even see why I could really carry the burdens of everybody else in this room. But that's the great thing about God. And then he began to transfer that burden back to God. And he stepped into what it was that he called brought upon his son to do. To take on those sins. To die so that we, we didn't have to. To walk and walk that we didn't have to. Now we can still choose to go that route. And many people sadly still choose to go that route. They still choose to reject Jesus. And they still choose to to reject eternal life. But I don't have to die this afternoon. I don't think anybody said this room has to. We chose eternal life. But it, it, he paid for it all, but it still comes at a cost to us by being that bond service. By being willing to submit our life unto him. And so that brings us in the spiritual perception of how it is that, that we should look at it how it is that we should uh, focus our prayer towards it. We don't need to focus our prayers in on ourselves. But we need to focus our prayers in on Him and what His will is for us. And then even, like I said, that power that uh, for me it comes down to a lot of willingness. It comes down to a lot of boldness. It comes down to a lot of grace to carry it carry out. Carry out his will, not our will. And so that's going to conclude our session for tonight. Uh, anyone who watched this online, we thank you for joining us.